So if you'd open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of Esther, chapter 4. We'll be reading there in a moment. A preacher named George Whitfield was known for having a very strong sense of urgency when he would preach the gospel. For us, it should bless our hearts to see people turn to Christ. Sorry, this is... uh, But it should also break our hearts when they turn away. George Whitfield often had to stop preaching and because he broke into tears. And when someone would suggest to him that he should control himself more, he said, how can I help from weeping for people when they don't weep for themselves? Every time I preach, I wonder if someone is hearing the gospel for the last time. So we too as Christians must understand that life is short, both for us and for the people around us. We must turn our lives over to Christ with urgency and also proclaim Christ to those around us as if it could be their last opportunity. Let's read our scripture this morning from the book of Esther chapter 4 verses 13 and 14. It says, Then Mordecai Uh, Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, sending a message to Esther that says, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom For such a time as this. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. God, I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would minister to each person here, God, that it would be by the power and wisdom of your Spirit, God, not by my words or my ability, Father, but by your Spirit, that you would touch the people in this place, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's important to understand that there is a strategy against us as Christians. And so to bring more clarity to this in in the text that I read this morning is the story of Esther. And Esther at this time in the story is, is the queen. And she is also a Jew. However, the king does not even know that she's Jewish. You see, if you're familiar with the story of Esther, you already know, but... Um, the previous queen made the king mad, and he disposed of her. So he went out to pick a new queen, and he found Esther, thought she was pretty good looking, and that's all it took back then. So Esther finds herself in a position, a very high and lofty position, uh, because the king just picked her out of a lineup. And Mordecai, this man who's sending a message to her, is her older cousin who raised her as her own as her own daughter after they were taken captive into Babylon and Esther was separated from her parents. Um, I personally don't have a cousin old enough to be my parent, but in this case, Esther did. So Mordecai was basically her father, but speaking uh, in the family tree, he was her cousin, but he had raised her. And so in our text, Mordecai is speaking to Esther about a dire situation for the Jewish people. They were in great danger, and the situation that he's speaking of is found in Esther chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 8 through 11. A man named Haman desires to wipe out the Jewish people, and it says this, Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the providence of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws, so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, and they may put it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the, the, the Agagite, the Agagite, 
from the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you, the people also, and do with them as it seems good to you. So in other words, Haman wants to pay people a lot of money to exterminate the Jewish people. And the king hands over his singet. This is like as if the president were to hand over the magic pen that he signs executive orders with to somebody else. He gives him the power to just, he says, just do what you need to do. I like your plan. So the Jewish people in this land are in great danger because of this law. And Mordecai understands that his cousin that he raised as his own child is in a very special and unique situation to save the lives of the Jewish people. She is the queen of the land. So he tells her, let's read our main text one more time, Esther 4, 13 through 14. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. So in other words, he says, listen, you might be royalty, but you're in trouble too. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jew, uh, r- rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. See, he understands that Esther in reality is in more danger if she does nothing. Even if she is spared from the slaughtering of the Jews, there is judgment, which is far worse. But then he says, maybe you are here for this exact reason. And so Haman has a strategy against the Jewish people. And if you read all throughout the Old Testament, you can see time after time Satan is coming after God's people, the people of Israel, and his desires to wipe out the race as a whole. And this strategy has not stopped. Even to this day, you see people across the world desire to destroy Israel. You see, Satan understood that Jesus, who would bring salvation to all of mankind, would come through this lineage, through the Jewish race. And Satan wanted to wipe them out before that could happen. Now in this story, we see a clear and deliberate strategy to destroy God's people. This is Satan's goal. And as we know, being in this place that Satan did in fact fail to stop the first coming of Jesus Christ... He is now, today, continually developing strategies to steal as many people away from Christ until Jesus comes back again. So what is the strategy that Satan has against us today? Satan, in reality, has only one goal and one goal only. And that is to bring as many people into hell with him as he can. There are many people who just don't get it. They call themselves devil worshipers or, you know, Satan's my homie or whatever. And they think, yeah, I'm going to go to hell. And somewhere their theology is bad, of course. But somewhere they believe that if I serve Satan adequately, when I get to hell, I'll be ranked. I'll be in charge. You know, I'll have a good position. This is actual religion that people have. But in the Bible, it's very clear that that is not the case. In fact, there is no rankings in hell. When people go to hell, Satan ain't even in charge of anything. He's suffering just like everybody else. But he doesn't want you to know that. That's part of his strategy. So to achieve this goal, the devil will tell us lies. That being the, a big one in today's day and age. There's many people who believe in hell and believe they're going there and are okay with that. They don't have a good understanding of what hell is. But oftentimes the devil will use more subtle strategies on people, convince them to live a life satisfying of the flesh and things like drugs and alcohol, sexual immoralities, unhealthy lifestyles, and slothfulness, just being downright lazy. That was, that's, that's me. I love to sit on my couch. That's the one the devil comes at me all the time. Why, uh, you know, you don't have to go do that right now. Just chill a little bit. Take it easy. Sometimes it's satisfying our eyes 
with things like immoral movies, TV shows, or even pornography. Something that is, all three of those things actually, I believe, are far more rampant in today's day and age than people admit. There's a lot of TV shows that people watch, but they don't, it's like the Game of Thrones, right? There's, there's a group of people who are like, oh yeah, I heard of that show, I saw a couple episodes. Um, but uh, you know, it's a long time ago. But uh, yet yeah, the show went for like how many seasons? Like a million? And so these people are watching it, right? P- nobody admits they're watching it, but they're watching it. I honestly can admit I haven't seen it, but I've heard it's horrible. <laughs> but these things that people do, these things that people go, oh, you know what? Yeah, that's not going to hurt me that bad. These are the subtle things that Satan will tempt us to indulge in. Or he will tempt us to satisfy our egos and things like power and money and success, continually pursuing careers or riches or education. These are things, some of these things are straight up sinful and some of these things are not. But when they consume our lives is when it can become a problem. And 1 John 2.16 warns us of this. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. So truly, no matter what his strategy is against us, the devil's goal is to steal our salvation, to kill us, and to destroy our lives. Many people don't like to hear that. It's pretty... uh, intimidating, it's sobering, and you can think of many people who are currently caught in this trap. But Jesus in John 10.10 10, says it very plainly, uh, plainly, speaking of the devil, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Have you ever heard of a thief that breaks into somebody's house just so he can tidy the place up a little bit? Maybe so he can say, listen, I'm going to take this from you, but I'm going to replace it with better things. This is what the devil wants you to think he's doing. Listen, you don't need to go to church. Hey, you don't need, listen, you're tired. You don't need to pick up your Bible tonight. Oh, you don't need to take some time to pray. Listen, you deserve this. You deserve that. He's taking the true riches. He's breaking in and taking the true riches and trying to convince us that he's replacing it with something better. But in reality, Jesus says he only comes to steal and kill and destroy. That is his one and only goal against our lives. And in 1 Peter 5.8 warns us, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour Now, these two texts brings a contrast of our lives. A thief doesn't, he breaks into your home, right? Or maybe your car, your personal space. But last time, I haven't heard any stories from you guys about a lion breaking into your home. So this is, brings an image of us in our lives, outside of our homes, or in our relationships with people who aren't in our homes. So the devil's trying to break into our private life, and the devil's trying to devour us outside of it as well. He's taking every angle he can get. Now when we read a text like this, the devil is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now listen, if we're in here and we see a roaring lion outside, guess what we're not doing? going outside. Nobody on here is crazy enough (laughs) to go outside. And if you are, you're asking for it, but that's, you know, I'm not going to get into that. So it seems like something easy to avoid, right? It seems like something you can go, okay, there's a line over there. I ain't going that way. I'm going the other way. But the truth is this type of devouring that the devil desires is one that can be subtle, one that can be unnoticeable one that can be completed before we even notice that it started. You see, this word devour in the Greek, in the Greek, (laughs) I told you guys, my voice is failing me today. In the Greek, Greek is not a language, is katapino, which means to swallow, 
to devour, to destroy, or to consume. So do you ever feel like maybe you're consumed by your work? You're swallowed by your financial struggles, being consumed by drama with your relationships, whether it be a family, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, friends, co-workers, whatever it is. Being destroyed by your bad habits. Your time is being devoured day after day by any of these things or more. You find yourself, think you know you have stuff to do, things to get to, and then all of a sudden you're like, man, I spent how long doing that? These are the subtle, yet can be very deadly strategies the devil has against us if we allow them to consume us. He's designed these things to devour us. And this obviously is not speaking of a physical devouring. I don't see any bite marks in any of you guys. I don't have any, except for maybe from my children. No, I'm just kidding. They don't bite me. But this is speaking spiritually. Listen, when I make the example of we look outside, we don't see a lion in the parking lot. We don't see a physical lion, but let me tell you, there is a spiritual lion. And we have to train our spirits to see that lion. To see him coming for us. To see him gnawing on us. Because that's what it is. Listen, lions are vicious creatures, but I've never seen him eat a zebra in one bite. It takes time. It's a slow process. And if we're not careful, if we're not vigilant, if we're not watching for this spiritual lion in our lives, through our workplaces, through our relationships, through our habits, eventually the devil takes his last bite and we didn't even realize he started. We just think we're going through some hard times. We do go through some hard times. But sometimes we allow the hard times to devour us, to consume us. To destroy us. This is the strategy against all people. The devil also has a strategy against Christians. Against the church. And his goal is if he can turn churches and Christians against each other. Then there will be no success. 2 Corinthians 2, 10-11 Paul writes, Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Paul understands what unforgiveness can do to the body of Christ. That is a scheme to cause division in our lives. Listen, if one of you guys in this place has a beef with someone else here, you probably haven't been listening this whole time. You're just side glancing at them across the room thinking, man, they're messed up. Man, they did me dirty. It's all you can think about. It's all that's on your mind. When people come against you, Rather, sometimes it's unknowingly. You, you ever had somebody that, that you're mad at and you finally confront them and they're like, man, I had no idea that that upset you. This could have all been water under the bridge if it would have been confronted in the moment. And guess what? Even if it was malicious intent, Paul says forgive people. Because at the end of the day, whether they deserve it or not, unforgiveness is a strategy of the devil against our lives. And if we refuse to forgive those who have hurt us, whether they ask for it or not, whether they deserve it or not, then we are being outwitted by Satan, by the roaring lion who desires to devour our lives. Some Christians find themselves turning to false doctrines. Or unsaved people finding themselves in false doctrines as well. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen through 15 speaks of this. Speaking of false teachers, says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. 
So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. You see, Paul is speaking very bluntly and very plainly about people who come in the name of Christ but are actually desiring to lead people astray. They say, he says, Satan himself comes as an angel of light. Satan was an archangel. Guess what? Just because he sinned and fell short of the glory of God and got cast out of heaven didn't turn him into a red demon with horns and a pitchfork and a pointy tail. He still appears as an angel of light. He still appears deceptive. And so it goes on to say there's no surprise that people who work for him are also going to act that way. They will make false claims like, yeah, you have to give to my ministry, pay for my class, buy my special anointing oil, or whatever it might be to be blessed. We encountered a woman at an outreach event, and uh, she began opening up about her struggles in her marriage and, uh, and addictions and things like this. And she goes, but next week I'm going to a deliverance class at this church. I'm not going to name the church. At this church, uh, and it's only, I think she said like $50. <laughs> and we told her, ma'am, you got to understand, you can have deliverance right now for free. Jesus paid for that already. Jesus paid the price for our deliverance already. You don't have to go to a class. That's a ripoff. We can pray for you right now. And your faith can make you whole. Jesus paid the price. But there's many churches out there. There are many places out there that say, hey, come pay for this class. Come. Could you imagine if I charged you guys admission to Bible study? Like, please, don't come. Like, I, I'm not that good. And I hope I never think I am. But to imagine charging people for the word of God, for the deliverance of Jesus Christ. Or they might come to you saying, we bring you new testaments of Christ or new scriptures that only we have. Listen, your church might be cool, but we got something they don't. We got this special book full of knowledge that nobody else has. Or some people will tell you, hey, you know, Jesus is good, but that's following him just isn't enough. You got to do this. You got to pray that. You got to act this way. Praying to God, yeah, that's cool, but you also got to pray to so-and-so, such-and-such. And if you don't say this prayer every day, then don't even count on getting into heaven. Don't miss Sunday service because there's communion, and communion is what saves you. Listen, communion's great. We do that here. Jesus says, do this. What does Jesus say? Do this what? In remembrance. If Jesus said, do this for your salvation, I would be preaching a different sermon. But that's not what he says. He says, do this in remembrance of me. But some... Religions have twisted it to saying you have to do this or else. And then verse 15 comes the fruit of their ministries. It says their end will correspond to their deeds. What is this end that Paul is writing about? In Revelations 20.10, it speaks of this end. And the devil who has deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever. Just as I spoke before, the devil is not going to have any authority in heaven. He's going to be in the same boat as everybody else there. And it's not a good one to be in. But this is the ends of their ministry, if you could call it that. This is the ends of their deeds. And this is the ends of the devil, and he knows it. The devil knows his future. He, some theology, some theologians believe that maybe he thinks he can prevent it. 
I don't know, but we know. We know what our Bible says and we know who our God is. And the devil knows where he's going. And he desires to bring as many people with him as he can. Revelations 20.15 says, If any man was not... If, any man, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is what the devil wants. He wants you to go with him. That's just the truth. So we as a church, as Christians in this place, we can't remain silent of these things. These are hard things to talk about. These are difficult concepts to tell somebody without totally making them angry that, listen, man, the life you're living is going to you're going to find yourself in the lake of fire, side by side with the devil. These are hard things to tell people. These are hard things to get people to realize without upsetting them, without turning them away, without, oh, I'm offended. That's what everybody says today, right? Oh, I'm offended. Listen, I, I, I'm no stranger to the Internet. I see plenty of things that offend me, but guess what? Move on. <laughs> if you really... I, I wish we lived in a generation that was tough enough. We could tell somebody, listen, the life that you're living is going to send you straight to hell. You need Jesus Christ. And if they decide not to believe it, they go, and then they move on. That'd be so much better. <laughs> anyway, that's totally different. Not what I'm here to talk about. It's a difficult thing to talk about. Damnation, being doomed to hell, all of these things. Pe people don't like hearing that. Even Christians don't like hearing that. Christians who are assured in their salvation, as soon as I say doomed to hell, damnation, dead in your sin, people are like, you know, just stop. Church, we have to be not afraid to preach these things. We have to be not afraid to warn people of this. If somebody's parked on the train tracks at the stoplight, you see the train coming and they don't. Are you afraid to tell them, listen, you're about to get plowed. We shouldn't be. That train's going to kill you. The devil is killing you. It's not out of condemnation. It's out of love. It's out of a desire to see them have the same faith and hope that we have. We can't remain silent. And in our text this morning, we see Mordecai make a very clear statement to Esther. You can't remain silent. Esther chapter 4 verse 14 he says, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. You see, Esther was aware that if she tried to stop the destruction on her people, she could be killed for breaking the king's laws. This is a day and age where, yeah, she's the queen. Yeah, the king's her husband. But you don't approach the king unless you're invited. This is the laws of their land. If you approach the king without the king calling you to him, it is a death sentence. It's not a, hey, get out of here. You're not supposed to be here. It's not a fine. It's not a fee. It's not thrown in the stocks for a couple weeks. It's death. And Esther knows that. And Mordecai is challenging her, confront the king. And Mordecai is telling her that certain death, spiritually speaking, is found when we are not moving within what God has called us to do. When we are not living the life that God desires for us. Mordecai essentially makes the point that, listen, the king might kill you if you approach him, but that's far worse than if you do nothing. And Mordecai even has faith, knowing that God will deliver his people, as he has time and time again and continues to do throughout the Old Testament. He says, for relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. He said, listen, if you don't do it, God will get somebody else to do it. But you and your father's house will perish. But if you don't do it, you're done. Mordecai is reminding her that she can't afford to remain silent. The cost is too great. 
And she is in a unique position to help her people. And just like Esther, there is a tragic cost if we remain silent when we are called to speak out to the people around us. I couldn't imagine, like I said before, seeing somebody parked on the train tracks. You know, it's not like in the movies where they can't back up, can't go forward, nobody's paying attention. I'm talking about just somebody chilling on the train tracks. All they got to do is back up, right? Or get out of the car. And you're sitting there and you see the train coming and you go, Ah, it's cold outside. Do I really want to get out? They'll see it. It's loud. And trains are loud. They'll see it coming. They'll figure it out. I don't want to offend them. I don't want to upset them. Like, the, you know, hey, get out of the train. And they'll be like, oh, you think I'm not paying attention? You think I don't know what I'm doing? This is my life. <laughs> you know, you think about all of these things that when you want to witness to people and you say, listen, there's a, there's a, a lion who desires to devour you. And he's gnawing on your leg as we speak. And we're so worried about people getting offended and upset by the message of truth. By the gospel. Listen, the worst thing that can happen is that they don't be, you know, they don't want to be your friend anymore. Or they damage a relationship. And, and I get it. That, that can be difficult depending on the relationship. But what, would it be better to have said your piece? To have said, listen, things got to change. Or to watch them die and go to hell, but you still had a relationship with them. I don't want to be up close and personal to watch that happen, so I might as well say my piece, right? And most relationships, if they're good enough, right? <laughs> like, I, I could say some things to some family members, and they'd be like, what the heck? But we would still, you know, still be family, right? Not always true, but... We can't afford to remain silent. We can't afford to just watch people get devoured, to watch people get plowed by a train. Esther couldn't afford to watch her people get slaughtered in her own streets. And if we don't speak to those who are in danger, we too can find ourselves perishing in different ways. If we see the lion devouring somebody so close to us, guess what? We're close to the lion too. Matthew 5.13, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. I love salt. But if it didn't have any flavor, I wouldn't add it to my food. It does me nothing. Salt was also used as a preservative in Bible times. But Jesus is saying, we are the salts of the earth. We're the preservative. We add the flavor. We maintain things. God desires to use us as that, as Christians, to do these things. But if we lose our saltiness, if we're just little tiny rocks, then what good are we? We get thrown out and trampled over. The salvation that we have is not something to be kept to ourselves. We are called to share it with the world. We are called to witness to people. And the cost to others if we remain silent is, there, is, is great. It is their death. Just if you don't tell somebody a train's coming, guess what? They get hit by the train. Mark 16, 15. Jesus gives the Great Commission. He says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. This is God's calling for our lives. He has called us to preach the gospel, to witness to people. And listen, many people think preach the gospel, they think what you know, standing behind a pulpit and witnessing to people, or even being in front of crowds. Preaching the gospel is anything from what I'm doing to the street corners to your just one on one conversations with family and friends, with random people at the supermarket, whatever it is, we are all called to preach the gospel in one way or another. Many people think preach and then it's immediately behind a pulpit. That's not the case. Preaching is just proclaiming. Preaching is just speaking truth. Speaking the gospel into people's lives is what Jesus desires everyone to do. And we have to have the mentality, just like George Whitfield, that if we don't proclaim the gospel, 
And if we remain silent, nobody else will. That when we witness to people, we could be the last person to witness to them. And if we don't, they will die in their sin. We are charged to speak up in this time, and we are in strange times. But we are all here in our lives, in this church, in this city, for such a time as this. In our main text, Mordecai challenges her. He says, And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this, that God placed her into royalty for this exact reason. This is the purpose of your life. This is why you are here, Mordecai says. Now is not the time to be afraid. Now is not the time to back down. Because this is what God has called you to do. And none of us here are queens like Esther. None of us here hold high political power. At least I don't think. But not all of us have to be those things to achieve what God has put us in this life for. We don't have to have authority. We don't have to have riches. We don't have to, it says Queen Esther was of great beauty. We don't have to be gorgeous, handsome, any of these things. We don't even have to be smart. Thank God. The Bible says that God desires to use the foolish to shame the wise. We just have to be willing to step up to what God has for us in our lives because we were born for this time. God didn't make a mistake putting us in this generation. I oftentimes think, man, it would, be, it would seem better to be born like 200 years ago or something. Like how much simpler would life be? Uh, but you know what? We weren't. Here we are. And we were born for such a time as this. We're living in a time just like any other time since the coming of Christ where we are charged to preach the gospel and proclaim Christ to as many people as we can until the second coming of Christ. If you're familiar with end times prophecy, it certainly feels close. <laughs> Things are getting wild. There's a lot of crazy stuff happening around the world. So what is the second coming of Christ? Jesus speaks of it himself in John 14, 2 through 3. He says, In my Father's house are many rooms. I like this. If it were not so, I would not have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. He goes, In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it wasn't true, I wouldn't have told you. <laughs> and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Jesus is saying, I'm not preparing this room for you just for fun, just hoping you'll come and visit. I'm going to come get you. I'm going to come take you to where I am. This is speaking of his second coming. God is right now preparing a place for us in heaven. Isn't that great? I can't wait to get there. Jesus is coming a second time. Hebrews 9.28, also speaking of this. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of money, this is the first coming. And then it goes on to say, will appear a second time. This is the second coming. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Jesus came the first time to deal with our sins. Praise God, we're saved. And he's going to come the second time to bring us home. So how can we eagerly wait for him? Well, it's not like sitting in a waiting room at the doctor's office. But Jesus charged us in the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. In other words, he's saying, listen... While you're waiting for me to come back, you need to go 
make more Christians. You need to go witness to people. It's like when you're at work and your boss leaves and he says, listen, I've got this, this, and this for you to do before I get back. Get them done. And then as soon as he leaves, guess what? You're waiting for your boss to get back, right? But you're not sitting around because if you get back and you haven't done what you're supposed to do, boss is unhappy. My boss leaves the office a lot and every now and then he says, hey, get that done, get that done. Those become the things that I make sure to get done before he gets back, right? Because <laughs> I want to get paid. We have to be diligent in the tasks that Christ has given us before his return. And I thoroughly believe time is running out. I believe that we are living in a generation where we will see the second coming of Christ. And if not myself, my children. And I sure hope so because it's only getting worse. Time is running out and we have to realize this. We have to move with urgency because we don't know when Christ will come back. I, I tell you, I believe it's going to come in my lifetime. I really do. And if not my children's lifetime. But the reality of it is, I, I can't promise you that. And if I do, then you can stand up and call me a liar. Because, <laughs> because the Bible is very clear. We don't know when Christ will return. Luke 12, verse 40. Jesus says, You must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So what if Christ returns? What if Christ comes back and in that moment we realize we've spent our life building for ourselves a retirement fund, building for ourselves a career, immoral relationships and habits and all of these things that amount to nothing in that moment because it's all over. What if Jesus Christ comes back and we realize I have not spent any time proclaiming the gospel, witnessing to sinners? And in that moment, may or may not be saved. That's between you and God, right? But the question isn't, are you saved? The question is, have you done what you can to save other people? We have to proclaim Christ to people as if the second coming is coming any moment. Because actually it can, right? We don't know when it'll be coming. I'm not expecting it to come by the end of my sermon, but who knows? <laughs> I might never finish this. We have to proclaim Christ to people as if we are the last person to tell them. This is why we have an altar call at the end of every service. This is why we have an altar call at almost all of our events. Because we don't know what's going to happen when somebody walks out that door. We don't know what's going to happen between now and the next time we see someone. We don't have time to wait. Romans 5.8, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the message that we cling to and this is the message that we must be proclaiming to people Listen, hell, it's a real place. Fire and brimstone, torture all day long, it's, it's real. And the devil's going there and he's trying to take you there too. But listen, Christ died for you while you were still sinners. Christ died so that you don't have to go there. That's a, that's a reality. And if you don't repent, you don't turn from your ways, you will end up there. And guess what? Serving Satan ain't going to do you no good. Because he's going to be tortured day and night right next to you. We were all dead into our sin until we accept the sacrifice of Christ in our lives. Even though we sinned against Christ, he died for our salvation. And before our lives come to an end or Christ returns, we have to accept this for ourselves as well. Philippians 2, 12 through 16 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, 
Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is not God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. In this text, it says we must work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. What does this mean? What, is, what does that phrase mean? Many people grapple with this. Like, is this a works thing? Is this, I have to, you know, do a certain thing to work out my salvation? Listen, I don't decide if you guys are saved. The person sitting next to you doesn't decide if you're saved. But rather, this text is speaking, work out your own salvation. Your salvation is between you and God. Nobody else. Nobody can decide your salvation except for you and God. So what does this mean? What does that mean for you? Well, just as Esther had a very specific calling on her life, a very specific moment in her life where she had to act, are we working out our own salvation when we say, God, my life is yours. I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and I desire to act in my life Because I know that you've put me in this moment for such a time as this. For such a moment as this. And I'm not saying if you make a misstep or you miss a cue from God that you're going to go to hell. I thank God because I will be right there with you. (laughs) None of us are perfect, but working out our own salvation means that we are working it out with Christ. That we are one-on-one with God saying, listen... I'm saved and I know I'm saved. What do I need to do to continue to be saved, to continue to walk in your will for my life? It's not a works thing, but rather an understanding that our faith in Christ is what we need. There's people who will come against you and say, oh, you're not a real Christian, or you're not this, you're not that. Oh, you dress that way, oh, you dress this way, oh, your church does this, or your church does that. Listen, there's a lot of people that dress certain ways. There's a lot of people that talk certain ways. There's a lot of churches that do certain things. At the end of the day, it's between you and Christ. Can we work out our own salvation? And not knowing the day of Christ's return, we have to be diligent to protect our salvation. This is part of working out our salvation is that it's not a one and done thing. You say a sinner's prayer and you're good for the rest of your life. But Jesus says, pick up your cross daily. Accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior is, is like a daily decision. It's a lifestyle. And James four thirteen through 14 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town, and spend a year there, and trade, and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time, and then vanishes. You know, you hear people say all the time, oh, I'm just going to live my life. I'm young. I got a lot of life ahead of me. Listen, that Jesus thing, I'll go to church when I'm older, when I have kids. I'll get my life together at some point. But this text right here says, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. You don't know what's going to happen. I just read a story the other day of a 22-year-old kid who got shot because somebody thought he was somebody else. He wasn't even doing anything wrong from what I understand. Not to mention there's things that just happen, car accidents, all of these things. not trying to make everybody fear for their lives, but the reality is we don't know. We don't know what tomorrow holds for ourselves and the people around us. My dad, at the age of 53, healthy on Monday, gone on Friday. Got sick and it happened that fast. 
I wasn't expecting that. I didn't know that my tomorrow would hold the death of my father. Thank God he was saved. Thank God he was right with Christ. I couldn't imagine living with it otherwise. But for us and the people around us, we don't know how much time we have. We don't know how much time we have with the people around us. And this isn't even about death either. This is, like I said, the second coming of Christ. It could happen before the end of the sermon, and some of you guys by now are probably hoping it does. Going a little longer than normal. But church, time is short. And even if we live a long, healthy life, 80-something years old, 90-something, maybe even, God willing, 100 years old, that's still not very long. Eternity is long. And I believe that whether we die or the second coming happens in our lives, if it's not now, it's soon. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 speaks of the signs of the end times. It says, But understand this, that in the last days there will be times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self. TikTok, Instagram. Lovers of money. Look, just look at the stock market. Proud. Arrogant. I'll go right back to TikTok and Instagram. I don't have to get creative here. Abusive. Disobedient to their parents. Look at the generation of children today. Lost my spot. Ungrateful. Unholy. Ungrateful. You didn't get my Big Mac out fast enough, and I told you no pickles. Mom, I don't like that food. Mom, I don't like the way you talked to me the other day. Or brother or sister. I'm not trying to... Don't read into that. I was just thinking about the other day, my, my, we had dinner, my wife labored over it, and the first thing out of my daughter's mouth was, ew. Anyway... She's not in here. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. That's the, that's the real kick in the pants at the end, right? You, you, get to, you get through verses 1 through 4, and you're like, ah, you know, I might sometimes slip up in those areas, but not that bad. And then verse 5, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Let that not be our church. Let not people come in here and think, oh, those are good Christian people. But we're denying the power of Christ. These are the signs of the end times. These are exactly who it says at the very end, avoid such people. In Matthew 24, 6 through 7, Jesus speaking of signs of end times, you will hear, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. That doesn't happen much these days, right? <laughs> I mean, you don't hear of it if you don't turn on the news, right? And then he goes on to say, see that you are not alarmed for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. That's another one too. Fam famines and earthquakes in various places. You guys notice there's a lot of weird natural events that are happening in places that normally happen. I think last year we, we had an earthquake in the Tri-Cities. It wasn't anything huge, you know, no buildings tipped over, but it's like, dang, that doesn't happen here. Think about what's going on in the world. China versus Russia. Russia versus the U.S. Russia versus the Ukraine. North Korea versus the U.S. and pretty much the entire world. Hamas and many other nations versus Israel. There's so much tension in the world. There's tension across almost every single country in the Middle East. And pretty much the whole Middle East hates Israel and hates us. We hear rumors of war constantly. 1 Timothy 4.1 
Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. There are many religions in today's world that are devoted to just this. Islam is a religion that hates Judaism and Christianity, and it is also the fastest growing religion in the world. Think about that. And it says, depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits. You know, Islam actually has prophet, prophecies in their religion that are based out of the Old Testament. They use parts of our, of our Bible. This is exactly what this is speaking of. And in addition to that, a religion called Wicca is also one of the fastest growing religion, religions in America. And Wicca, less commonly known as pagan witchcraft, it's pretty self-explanatory once you go by its less commonly na known name. It's probably growing because they changed the name. Hey, you want to join my pagan witchcraft? People are like, what? <laughs> but hey, you want to be a Wicca? Or you want Wiccan? You know, that's, 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 I'll admit, that sounds a little cooler. <laughs> but this is a religion based around, only around, intentionally seeking out evil spirits, doing witchcraft. It's not even like they're being deceived into, into a religion that's trying to convince you it's the right way. It's like, hey, you want to go do some evil stuff? <laughs> yeah, sure, let's go. This is one of the fastest growing religions in America. Think about that. Matthew 24, 13 through 14. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. The scripture in Timothy I just read, people will depart from the faith, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits. But Jesus says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Throughout our entire life, whenever it comes to an end, there will be things. Come this way, come that way, do this, do that. Hey, check out this church, check out that faith, check out Wicca. But Jesus says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. When Christ returns, where will we be? What will we be doing? What will we have done? Will we have worked out our salvation? Like if somebody, if it's not going to happen this way, so don't quote me on this is the way the end of the world happens, but if somebody goes, hey, two seconds, Jesus is about to come. Your brain can process a lot of thoughts in two seconds. What's going to be your thoughts? Oh, crap. I could have done so much more. I could have done so many more things for the kingdom of God. Or is it going to be, oh, finally. Because you know what's about to happen. And you know that God puts you in a time for such as this. And you carried out what he desired you to do. And are we witnessing to this generation? This generation who is full of all of these things I talked about. I'm not going to cover them all again. Don't worry. Are we telling them, listen, hell is real, but so is Jesus. Time is running out. Let us proclaim the gospel with urgency so that when our time comes to step into eternity, whether it be by the end of our life or by the second coming of Christ, we know that we rose to the occasion that God called us to. Can I have every head bowed and every eye closed?